Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like at this time to, uh, to ask all in the council chambers to turn off your electronic devices or at least set them to vibrate so that it doesn't disrupt the proceedings. Uh, today's date is April 5th. There is no public hearing. There are no new petitions. Uh, so we will go right into, uh, I'll call the um, administrative session into, into order. So the first item on the administrative session were the items listed for the public hearing agenda dated April 5th, but in reality what they are are the two tabled petitions from the last meeting on March 5th. That is 600 Silver Lane, um, both uh, requesting two variances. So since they are on the table, uh, and just for the record, uh, uh, Mr. Baird is not present tonight. He's not, he's under the weather, so uh, Ms. Doolin is uh, filling in for uh, Mr. Baird. And Mr. Tickey is filling in for Renee Gibson, who was unable to attend today due to a scheduled conflict. So again, back to the administrative session agenda. The first items are the uh, 600 Silver Lane. They are on the table. The chair will entertain a motion if anyone wants to take them off the table for discussion purposes. Make a motion to take uh, the two items off the table for discussion purposes. Motion by Mr. Llewellyn. Do I hear a second? Second by Ms. Witham. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The items are now open for discussion and or motion. Does anybody wish to begin the discussion? Hi, Christine Doolin. Um, I was not here, but I did review, watch the YouTube of the meeting last month. So I'm aware yes. of what has been going on so far. Very good. Um, I, a lot of concerns were expressed by the people at last month's meeting that I had myself, so I was glad to hear that. Um, I, I know what was done in 1967, you know, was a mistake, but I don't think, you know, two wrongs are going to make a right, so I, I, that's what, just what I wanted to say at this point. Very good. Anyone else want to have any discussion on the issues? Ms. Witham. I um, understand, you know, our role or a hardship consists of one of them is one of them is not financial or should not be financial, and that's what this seems like to me. I mean, I know it's only a, a foot or whatever on each side. I get that it's probably that part is probably not really a big deal, but the what the um, what they're using to be a hardship is really the financial side of that is what I see. The other thing I'd like just to make a comment, and I don't know if. Um, you, Gavin, or, or even Dan can answer. I find that sometimes um, the attorney who presented sort of is always telling us the rules. And I don't know whether he's telling us the right rules, or the wrong rules, um, the law when I refer to rules. And, and I feel like we sh he wants us to just take it for what it is and I don't know if it's right or wrong, and I feel like I'm not getting direction, and of course I don't know all the, the laws. So I just was wondering if anybody had a comment on that. Well, since we have our attorney present, I'm gonna to defer to our legal authority, Mr. Floor. Well, um, us lawyers don't know all the rules all the time. Uh, what, what, what specifically did attorney not state that you had questions on? <coughs> um, there was quite a few things I don't remember specifically, but I did also listen again to, to the meeting from um, last month. But he just keeps referring to things that he's calling the law or whatever. And are they? I don't know. Are they? Are, or I don't know. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously we're always happy to address questions that come up. Uh, especially with more complicated applications like this one. Um, it's just, it's kind of difficult for me to answer questions right now, you know, on the fly, if you have something specific. I mean, I think you just referenced uh, uh, one of the hardships attorney not cited was a financial hardship. Mm -hmm. Generally, those aren't favored uh, unless the application of the zoning regulations 
has the effect of destroying the value of the property. Um, but um, generally, if, 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 if an applicant wants to wants the variance to put the, 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 the property to, to a more profitable use, that's, that, that's not usually considered a, a legal hardship. And I, I, I actually did not watch the, uh, the application last time. I wasn't here. But I'm here for legal advice. The, the factual determination is ultimately up to you guys. So you guys are the ones who are going to decide whether or not the applicants demonstrated a legal hardship. Mm -hmm. And who's, um, you know, he kept referring back to the 1967 um, approval and that, you know, the town did things differently back then and they maybe didn't go out and measure or whatever they do, the site plan, the, you know, all that stuff. So he's, you know, kind of saying, well, the, the, the applicant purchased the property assuming it was right because the town approved it and gave him a, what was it, a, a special, um, what do they call it, Dan? Uh, they were approved a special case through the Zoning Commission. Yeah, so is that our fault? Is that their fault? Is that, I mean, is, is it a fault of anybody? Does that mean we just say, okay, you can have it because it was a mistake? I mean, it, 20, 50 years ago? Uh, Dan, that's, I, I don't want to mean to put the, put the onus on you, but what, what happened exactly? Uh, I, not, I, I don't remember the year right off the top of my head, but uh, special case approval was granted right around 1950, 1960, for the establishment of a church with the rectory. Okay. And that special case, um, apparently they built the house and the rectory too close to one another. And when it got approved, when it was all done, it was obviously approved incorrectly. Right? But that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, an interesting argument for turning not to make. He's known for his creative arguments. Um, I don't know. I really don't have enough facts in front of me right now to advise you guys. I mean, uh, saying there was some sort of error or the town never checked to see to ensure that the buildings were sufficient distance apart. Was that what Attorney Knott was saying? That's what he's saying. Uh huh. Do we know if that's true or I, not true? Who knows? I know. Who so, knows? Sorry to jump in here, um, but it seemed like one of the things that was inferred was that this application came through before they reviewed site plans as part of special case. So it's unlikely that that same scenario could happen again today just because of the presentations and going through the, the, the that special case item 20 process is a little bit, uh, is a little bit different. Yeah, I, that's certainly true. I think Dan would would state the same that I think that it's uh, the zoning process is more rigorous than it was back in the 1950s and 60s for sure I just um, you know I don't have the benefit of attorney not being here tonight and even if he was here he couldn't address he couldn't address the board because the, the public hearing is closed mm -hmm. you know what I mean so uh, once the public hearing is closed you're sort of limited to what what testimony and evidence you took when the public hearing was open. Obviously, you can ask Dan and myself for technical advice tonight, but uh, generally no new information tonight can be given. So another, uh, another question to, um, to Attorney Florek by the chair. One of the other kind of concepts that got brought up last month um, more than once and although we're going to talk about it in this specific case, I'd also kind of like to get a little bit of a general ruling on the concept of it. But uh, Attorney Knott also kind of seemed to state quite strongly that if this variance were to be granted, it would make the property in question something along the lines of less non-conforming. And as an attorney and town attorney advising us as a board, I would kind of like to get your ideas on that, both specific to this case and then in terms of, you know, general idea of less non-conformity well yeah you, you can grant a, a zoning variance if it makes the property less non-conforming you can generally do that um again i wasn't i wasn't here last month for attorney Knott's presentation so you know i don't have the specific facts that he relied on when he made that argument any additional questions Ms. Dolan. 
Uh, it's not a question. I think that's what I was trying to s express the first time about, you know, one wrong way back in 67 doesn't mean we have to make everything right today. You know, like you said, it's, some, it's, it's still going to be nonconforming. And is that going to perpetuate more nonconforming lots because of if we allow this? And um, as far as attorney not like telling us what our job is, it's to grant relief. Is that true? Um, the, the purpose of a zoning variance is to, 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 to provide some flexibility in the application of the zoning regulation. So that's what they're here for. They're here for relief from the, the literal application of the zoning regulations. Now, the, the, the hardship requirements, pretty, pretty, actually pretty difficult. You know, you have to show a legal hardship. Um, as Dan, you know, always states in his comments, you know, uh, it's, it's not an easy burden to bear. But you do have the authority to grant a variance, and that's the relief they are seeking. And again, Dan, how many days do they have to, does this board have to decide the application once the public hearing is closed? Is it 35 or is it 65? 35. 35? Yep. Well, in, in the future, I mean, I, I just, uh, I'm, un, un, I'm able to give you sort of general pronouncements on the law, but not specific, not specific to this case because I, you know, I just don't have all the facts in front of me right now. So in the future, you, I mean, feel free to, 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 to issue, uh, ask for answers to some of these questions through Dan. I'm happy to address them. I just, um, I'm just hearing about some of these issues for the first time tonight. One of the things um, that Barry Knott said was that um, if this particular one was approved, it doesn't necessarily set a precedent, precedent going down, down the road. Is that true or not true? That's one of the questions that I couldn't think of when I was talking to you before. I think generally, because the granting or denial of variances are always very fact specific, you know, so each property is different, mm -hmm. you know. So I would, I would generally, generally, the granting of a variance in one case doesn't uh, justify the future granting or denial of variances in another case. Now there are there are exceptions to that, and and you know one is Stratford has a lot of undersized lots, you know. So if the ZBA is going to grant a variance uh, on 90 undersized lots, but not on not on the 91st, I mean you might have an issue there. But uh, I I don't think in a in, in a case like this, this seems to be a rather unique situation. Mm -hmm. Did you check? A uh, question for uh, Dan. Is my mind correct in the thinking of we have a overall conforming lot and this application is trying to implement a non-conforming lot within the conforming lot? Yeah, the way I looked at this application was initially we have a conforming lot which meets all of our zone development standards a special case was granted for the establishment of the church in that zone along with the rectory. Uh, Attorney Knott's presentation was saying they have an existing single family house, which currently is true. When that actually converted, I, I don't know that. Um, so he's going with the argument that having two principal structures on one lot this lot, therefore, is um, non-conforming. So there's two different arguments there. Um, you know, if the rectory was established, in my opinion, when it was built, there probably wasn't a setback from the church. They probably could have built it 10 feet or 100 feet away on a piece of property like this. Um, but that's kind of, you know, there's a couple different arguments, and one can be right. They both can be right. So it's... Thank you. Sorry, Chris again. Um, I was looking on the some map on the town hall with the assessors, and I thought it only showed one building, the church, and not the residence. 
Um, and I noticed that no taxes have been paid, I guess, because it's a church. And is that a single, is that house occupied now as a single family house? Do you know? I don't believe it is currently occupied. Um, it is, it, it has been being used as a single family in the past. Okay, and still no taxes have been paid on that property. Not, not that I'm, I, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Just for clarification purposes, that's not within the scope of the board in, to determine whether or not taxes are being paid on a piece of property, correct? No. Nope. Thank you. In addition, just to get back to Ms. Witham, each case is independent, meaning that there's no precedent. The only time there's a precedent is if, for example, if the Zoning Commission was to change a regulation. If there was an approval of a regulation, then that's precedent. You now have a new regulation. But from a very standpoint, they're individual case by case based upon the testimony received and the board's feeling on whether or not it, the relief should be granted. So as I understand it, we have to take action on this this evening because 35 days will run as of tomorrow. So we have no choice. It cannot be tabled. We either have to approve or reject. So uh, more than willing to uh, engage in additional conversation and discussion, but at this point in time, I think it would be appropriate for someone to make a motion to either approve or deny. Mr. Tickey. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to not deny the application. Um, in my mind, I can't see creating a non-conforming lot within a conforming lot, and I don't believe the applicant has met the requirement of hardship under our um, pervy. Uh, I understand wanting to collect rent on a house, but I don't feel the applicant did his homework when he purchased the property. Um, they had to purchase the property. The property has to have some kind of intended purpose and I think in hindsight they decided to try to make a rentable house and without doing their homework. Okay, we have a motion to deny. Do we hear a second? I'll second that motion. Carrie Whittem, I'll second that motion. Seconded by Ms. Witham. Discussion on the motion. Does anyone wish to discuss the motion? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just Mr. have Long. a kind of final question. Um, these are listed as two separate items, but really they can't be separated. They kind of need to be acted on together and in effect by, if this were to get approved, does it sort of in a roundabout sort of way create a subdivision of the, the whole parcel by having the house church then be separated? I mean, if, and if I'm getting into gray area here, then you know, I, can, I can be redirected and or research this on my own. What, what, are the, what specifically are the two variance applications they're applying for, Dan? Uh, side yard setbacks. Okay. Property line splitting the church in gotcha. the house, identical 10, point, 10 feet, gotcha. two inches from the house to the property line and the property line to the church. Gotcha. So those are the two specific applications. Correct. Right. One, one for the house. And one for the property, church. And one for the church. Okay. Property. And Mr. Llewellyn, what was your specific question again on, on? Well, it almost feels like if they can't be separated and this particular item were to be approved, does it in sort of a way create like a, a subdivision of the property and that you now have two separate pieces whereas now there's only one? Yeah. Th that, did, Dan, do they have to go to planning too and get? No, in order for it to qualify for a subdivision, it needs to be a creation of three or more properties. Mm -hmm. um, this, this would be um, a what would, what's called a resubdivision. Basically, it's creating one lot. This would not have to go to planning commission because it meets all of our standards. It does have to go back to our zoning commission, though, for modification of the site plan approval which Mr. Knott noted at the first meeting. And that will happen regardless of how we rule on this petition? Or they only have to go back to zoning if this were to get approved? Only if this gets approved. Thank okay. you. Nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank Let you. me interject here because now I'm confused. In your letter, 
dated February 24th, you specifically state it should be noted that if the variances are approved, the application will also require additional approval through the Planning Commission to verify that the proposal conforms to the Town, Stratford, town of Stratford subdivision regulations. Were you erroneous when you wrote this? Because you're now telling us that it doesn't have to go to planning. No, you, you are correct. I misspoke on that. Okay. So just for clarification purposes, if we were to approve this this evening, I know there's a denial on the floor. If we were to approve it, it is not a final decision. It's, it, the variances are granted, but it still has to go back to planning for review of a subdivision, as Mr. Llewellyn was addressing his concern about creating a subdivision. We do not have the authority to create a subdivision, only variances. They would have to go to planning, who would then have to determine whether or not they would approve a subdivision of the property, then go back to zoning for the special, for a uh, amendment to the special case application from 1967 approving it. So it would have to go to two more bodies besides this one. If we deny it, they could still go to planning and say, we, this is what we'd like to do, and eventually come back here with a, with a, with a, a different proposal. But under the circumstances, it still has to go through two other boards, regardless of what we have to do. So we're, we're, whatever we do here tonight, if we reject it, they can still go around and request modifications and go through that process, So just so that you're all aware. So my question also is, did they offer any alternatives, like knock the church down and build whatever they want next door, knock the house down and, and go and, and take care of it that way? No, not that, not that I'm aware. Because then, that, then they could be conforming on both sides instead of now having two non-conforming properties. I mean, again, it seems like it's financial for them, and now we're creating two non-conformings. Well, yeah, let me just interject as well. A lot of this is speculation. No, it, it's not the applicant's responsibility to give us alternatives. I mean, the applicant could have sat there and said he's going to apply for an 830G and turn it into an affordable housing complex based upon... or. or development, I don't use the word complex, an affordable housing development based upon the acreage of the property as it currently is as a single parcel. So he had that opportunity, but he did not offer any alternatives, nor is it his obligation to do so. Um, I'm confused at that, because when I came before the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance at my property, one of the first questions that was asked of me was, were there any alternatives? Well, yes. In terms of were there any alternatives in terms of, if you wanted to add a deck, for example, and you needed a variance, did you think of get, making a smaller deck? Did you think of putting it on the other side of the house? That part of this specific proposal. In this instance, if we had asked him, did you think of moving the existing house and taking 1.9 feet off of it to make it in compliance? That is, that is a, a legitimate question for that specific purpose. Not whether or not he wanted to come back and say, well, yeah, I want to put in seven houses or I want to... Uh, I didn't mean that. Oh, I apologize. No. I took it the wrong way. Not at all. Okay, very good. Okay, we have a motion and it's seconded. Is there any further discussion? So just, just for my own final clarity. So really the only thing that we're deciding on, because whether this is approved or denied, it can go through planning, would have to go through planning, then zoning, and so really what we're deciding on in terms of this variance is we're going to grant a variance because these properties are 18 inches too close to one another. I mean, yes, essentially the only thing you're here to decide is whether the applicant has demonstrated a legal hardship for the requested variances, which seems to be running a lot line down the middle of the two buildings, right? That's what they're looking for, two side setbacks. That's really all you guys are here for. And I think they're good. They, they're going to have to go to both boards anyway, and I don't think even if you guys deny it, I think they can alter their plan and come back to you with another proposal. I don't think they're precluded from doing that. Um, they're not. So your, only, your narrow decision here is whether or not they've demonstrated a legal hardship for the two variances they need. That's it. And they're claiming financial is their hardship, correct? Yeah, I mean, and like I said, that's generally not considered a hardship. Um, like I said, there are instances when the, the literal application of the zoning regulations so destroys the value of your property that you can demonstrate a hardship that way. But generally, financial hardships are, are frowned upon. And by financial hardship, as I mean, you can't, 
put your property to the most profitable use you, you want to be able to put it to. Let me interject once again. It is not from any of the testimony or documentation that was submitted by Attorney Knott. The applicant is not suggesting a financial hardship. The financial hardship is being suggested by the Zoning Enforcement Office as it states on page two of their memo of March, excuse me, February 24th, it says it appears that the hardship is self-created and that a financial hardship is in order to sell the single family dwelling and is not sufficient grounds for granting a variance. That's the opinion of our zoning enforcement officer. That is not the testimony as I recall it as submitted by attorney Knott. That is being planted into the equation by the zoning office. It is the town that is suggesting that. Well, the, the town department. Okay. Mr. Brennan, sure. Uh, the only reason why, sorry, the only reason why that was entered into the staff comments on the application, the hardship claim, variance needed so house can be sold from rest of property to conform with section 124 of the zoning regulations. That's the only reason why I noted a financial hardship should be looked at. Well, that draws a conclusion based upon the fact that from a legal standpoint, you can't sell a house if it's non-conforming. So it's not a financial hardship, it's a legal hardship from the standpoint you don't meet the setback of 1.9 feet. So for us to infer that there's a financial hardship, you can make that assumption, but I don't think we should be putting it in black and white because I think on appeal that would not look favorable that it's in our administrative minutes or in administrative memo that we're suggesting it's a financial hardship. And I don't want to be the one defending that case. Mr. Florek has to defend that case, not I. But if it's an appeal, I don't want to have to do that. Oh, I've tangled with Barry before. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Look, I'm just kidding. Uh, I didn't, if, if the, the, the part of the reason is their cited hardship is they want to split that. I mean, if they want to. I mean, look, you, you have the application in front of you. Um, the, the chairman says that Barry didn't make that argument specifically in front of you guys. That's true. I mean, you have the applicant. You have the application. You can infer what you want from it. You can take Barry's argument for what you believe it's for, you know, what it, for what it's worth. You guys are the ultimate decision here, not Dan, not me. You, you folks who were elected to this position and appointed if there's alternates sitting tonight. So... Yeah, the ultimate factual determination is for you guys to make. I'm just here for legal counsel. Thanks, Alex. Okay, yes, Chair. Yeah, Mr. Tickey. I'm getting lost now. Are you in a position where you could remind me of what the applicant's hardship was that they asked for? Yep, the two exist, let's see. Hardship is claimed, yes. What is the specific hardship? Two buildings exist on one lot. Pre-existing use, the variance is needed so the house can be sold from the rest of the property to conform with section 1.24 of the zoning regulations. So basically he's saying, you. I can't sell a house because it violates 1.24 unless I get a variance. Okay, we've had a motion, we've had a seconded, we've had extensive discussion. If there's no further discussion, let us call the motion. All those in favor of the motion to deny, say aye. 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 I'll vote aye. Let, them know, let the record show that the motion, the, both petitions one and two were denied 5-0. We took them as one parcel of property. So petitions one and petitions two from the last public hearing are denied 5-0. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the February 1st meeting, and I understand that there are some corrections. Two. Correction number one is Mr. Llewellyn is here. What is correction? As, as, he, was, he was present because obviously he made a motion in the minutes, so Mr. Llewellyn was present. Yes, and Ms. Whittam's name was incorrectly spelled, so a, a mo right. So the chair will entertain a motion to approve with those two amendments. Mr. Chairman, motion to approve the minutes as amended. By Mr. Llewellyn, do I hear a second? I'll second, second By <laughs> Ms. Whittam with her correct name. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries unanimously 5-0. CAM site plan reviews, none. Erosion sediment and control, none. 
Members, concerns and comments? None. All other items? None. Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Ms. Doolin, seconded by Mr. Tickey. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. We're off the record at 7.30. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.